you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much to the Yask people who invited me and for this great summer school that has been very provo thought provoking and uh, relevant for these current times. Just this morning as I was getting ready, I heard the BBC World Service radio that 46 people were found dead in a track in San Antonio in Texas, dead, uh, trying to cross the border, died of dehydration and uh, exhaustion and also this yesterday in um, um, Spain uh, you know uh, also um, around 20 uh, migrants crossing from Tunisia were found dead so I just want to begin with the relevance of this issue of refugees crossing borders my um, focus of research for the past 12 years has been borders borderlands and I have especially focused on the border between what was Republic of Macedonia, nowadays Republic of North Macedonia and Greece. So this border has been the locus of my research and I have tried to disentangle many issues, both theoretical and ethnographic, empirical, in terms of what's going on with this border that has been existing in its present form since 1913, the Bucharest Treaty that ended the First Balkan War. So it's interesting to see how this border, in its almost seemingly frozen form, you know, for more, more than a century, has been unfolding and enabling different processes to take place uh, in this region, you know, um, dividing different nation states that have changed throughout the history since 1913. So I just want to begin with a couple of theoretical reflections that will give you kind of a background of my ideas that I have applied to this border. Uh, as many of us doing border research and border studies, we have been heavily influenced by the work of Gloria Anzaldúa, you know, who published in 1987 the seminal, the thought-provoking book called Borderlands or La Frontiera, the new Mestiza. So this book actually changed the approach to border studies. Before borders were considered oppressive, repressive, you know, mechanisms, devices of controlling people, part of the nation state regimes. But, but what Gloria Anzaldúa actually introduces is that borderlands can also become uh, places of empowerment and agency. And she talks about the Mestiza, especially if stressing the gendered aspect of this, that uh, the for the people, the women, uh, you know, living in the border area, the Chicano women, are actually, uh, they are in a position to challenge the dominant forms of nation state regimes, but also to kind of uh, challenge patriarchy as well. So her work has been really influential in, influential in terms of, you know, um, being applied in anthropology. So many books have followed uh, applying or appropriating Anzaldúa's approach, like Renato Rosaldo's Culture and Truth that came out in 89, Emily Hicks' Border Writing, the multidimensional text in 1991, Ruth Behar, Translated Woman Crossing the Border with Esperanza Story, this came out in 1993, and many others. So it's been a while, but this approach has been really influential and I have been using it in my research as well, not wanting to reduce the border only on um, oppression, you know, domination, conflict, but also on the aspect of the productivity of borders, productive aspects of borders. And yet, there have been many critique, uh, critiques, very uh, justified and uh, valid on Anzaldúa's approach, especially important, and the one that I have been uh, relying on, is Pamela Ballinger's approach. She has actually been very critical. Uh, uh, she has done extensive research in Istria, in, um, uh, you know, the uh, Julian borderlands, and uh, she argues that uh, many scholars have actually romanticized and been have been excited by Anzaldúa's approach of positive and empowering aspect of borders using uh, hybridity as a concept to apply it to different contexts. However, many scholars have actually been unable to recognize the importance of the Balkans in borders, border studies. And that this concept of hybridity and multiplicity has actually not been so successful given the history that happened in the 90s, the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the, the wars that took place in the area. So what Ballinger argues is that, for instance, 
uh, despite the importance of hybridity in Istria or in Croatia, uh, uh, where she did her research, uh, the nation state regime and the dominance of the Croatian nation state policy has never been pra uh, effectively challenged. And I agree, I mean, there is a lot of kind of uh, excitement with this mestiza or kind of the new productive aspect of borders approach. And it's important to keep that in mind, but not in our region, the Balkan region, the Balkan area. This hasn't been materialized or hasn't taken, uh, kicked off the way it has in actually the, the US-Mexico region that has been the birthplace of border studies. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, there are this binary approach of the uh, repressive and the productive or the empowering aspect of borders, which is important, I recognize this. But my intention with the, the research on the borders in the most recent book, book that came out just a few months ago, it's called Border Porosity was for me to find a new way how to theorize and approach the border between Macedonia, Republic of North of Macedonia and North Macedonia and Greece, um, uh, to understand how this border has actually been both empowering and restricting for people. And in this presentation, I mean, I address different porosities, but today I want to kind of stress on one aspect, one porosity, one dimension of this porosity, which is rail porosity. I've been fascinating, fascinated by the role of railways and railroads. And I will use my ethnographic research that I conducted in 2014 and 2015 in the town of Gevgelia, which is a border town between Greece and uh, uh, Macedonia, uh, uh, Republic of North Macedonia. I apologize if I make an unintentional <laughs> mistake, but you know, it's not to, provo to provoke anyone, so please bear in mind. But uh, Gevgelia, in this period, as we all know, it was the period when there was a huge uh, refugee and migrant wave coming from Greece, Turkey, Greece to the Western, Western Europe. You know, when thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees and migrants went through the Balkan corridor. So Gevgelia really played an important role in this passage towards the West. Into the microphone? Into the microphone? Okay. So uh, I just, uh, before I begin uh, with the actual, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ethnographic empirical kind of research. I just want to, uh, this is very uh, kind of <laughs> naive drawing, but I just want to talk, uh, to say a word or two about the porosity concepts. I borrowed actually uh, the porosity concept from, you know, petroleum sciences and geology because I thought it really uh, kind of um, illustrates both theoretically, visually and conceptually what's going on at the border. They argue that every, you know, sediment, rock, stone has its own pores, its own voids and holes. They can be foggy, a, a longitudinal, or they can be round, moldic. And so basically nothing, no rock, nothing in the nature can resist porosity. Everything is porous. And from the research, historical and both ethnographic, contemporary, this border has shown that if there is any feature in its history since 1913, it's precisely this porosity in different forms, whether it's about uh, the mobility of people, railroads, consumption, services, capital, goods, ideas, there is porosity. No regime during socialism, prior to socialism, you know, between the two world wars, during Ottoman times, or in now contemporary times with all this crisis, refugee and migrant crisis that took place 2015, there hasn't been a possibility to seal off this border and to prevent porosity. So I thought that this uh, approach of uh, geological and petroleum engineering depiction of how porosity works is very novel in terms of conceptual and theoretical approach to kind of bypass this binarism of positive or negative aspects of borders. It's just inevitable. You know, by its physicality, it's necessary. So this was very, for me, empowering in order to show that this border, especially now I will focus on the railroads and railways, is very important in its kind of um, um, existence uh, and its, in its uh, kind of intensity throughout time. So, um, as I mentioned, October 2014, 
uh, until May 2015. It's a very important period because uh, the public, the attention of uh, the public and of uh, NGO activists, politicians, everyone in the Balkans was caught by several series of incidents at the railroads. Actually, it's interesting that, um, you know, uh, unprecedented view of people walking along the rail tracks, something unseen before. Uh, masses of people following the rail tracks, trying to pass from Gevgelia, the south of Macedonia, uh, to, uh, to the north, the end, you know, the border with Serbia, following the rail tracks. So it was mainly refugees from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Syria, but also many economic migrants from Northern Africa who, you know, were looking for better life. So basically these images, <gasps> Two minutes, okay. <laughs> so I got stuck with the theoretical stuff. So I'll just go through these images, you know, uh, all these people crossing the borders and the many accidents that happened, people were run by trains, not being able to hear the trains. 37 people were killed on the railroads. So caught the public's attention. This is Gevgelia in, uh, this is actually in the summer of 2015 when thousands of migrants and refugees came to be transported by trains. The asylum law allowed the refugees and the migrants to get legal permit to cross the country only in June 2015. And so the images of people, you know, waiting for the morning and evening trains in Gevgelia, literally thousands of people, you know, trying to board the old Yugoslav trains, the usual length of the journey from the south, from Gevgelia to Tabanovce, north of Macedonia, was around two to three hours. With these trains, it took seven to eight hours in the boiling summer heat. And so many of them tried to shelter, you know, underneath uh, the you know, trains. This lasted, this passage, this porosity lasted until, uh, until um, you know, uh, um, until Brussels decided that only refugees from Afghanistan and Syria would be allowed to travel. And so they closed the border for all the uh, migrants. This happened in November 2015. So many people were prevented from traveling, the economic migrants. There was a fence, you know, that uh, didn't allow people to continue. There was a refugee or migrant camp in um, uh, the no, no man's land between Macedonia and Greece. These are the st people stuck in between who try to protest against the police, you know, trying to continue traveling, but they were not allowed. And so, uh, you know, there were many performances and displays of protests of these people caught in between, not being able to travel further north. And one of the act of, uh, you know, uh, resistance and trying to protest is to, you know, uh, uh, sealed their lips because they felt that their most human, basic human rights were violated. So although the official media tried to present that this is mainly male, young males, there were many children caught in the, you know, uh, in between uh, this uh, refuge, you know, this migrant camp that wasn't allowed to proceed. And uh, this is really a, a you know, uh, I downloaded this from a Macedonian newspaper, you know, in which children were literally caught in the rails. I mean, this is uh, something so illustrative in terms of how the rail track itself became the site of, you know, embracing or preventing these people to further proceed. Now, uh, uh, I should conclude, okay. So this is the, the Avata uh, refugee camp that was built in Thessaloniki after the refugee, the temporary refugee camp in the no man's land uh, between Macedonia and Greece was closed down. And uh, this still remains in Thessaloniki actually nowadays. Uh, and uh, you know, this is the new route that emerged. It started, uh, um, you know, the previous one was from Thessaloniki, Skopje, and then Belgrade, uh, Hungary, but that, that was interrupted. And the new one that became very prominent in the 2016 and 17 was the one going through, you know, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia. Uh, and then further to, to Austria. But now we know how violently these routes were disrupted with wire barbs, you know, with the strong military uh, and policing of the 
borders. And yet, nowadays still we have intensive crossing, illegal crossing of the border. So my point that the porosity uh, cannot be interrupted or stopped entirely is really uh, 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 an evident everyday fact. I had prepared, you know, some historical reflections of this rail track that was built in 1871, the Thessaloniki Mitrovica, then that went all the way to Belgrade, and how this railroad has always been a channel, a foggy kind of porosity channel. But I will leave that, uh, you know, for you to read in my book. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the uh, interesting uh, <clears throat> presentation.